A dependence on infidelity is what makes many cheaters sick. They realize that they are doing a terrible thing, but something pulls them anyway. And in the end, they all end up badly. Maybe my wife didn't want to cheat on me, but she did it anyway and will answer for her actions. Shelly propped herself up on one elbow, watching him as he headed for the bathroom. She couldn't deny the appeal of his well-defined muscles. Broad shoulders adorned with strong muscles, long legs with sturdy calves, and a slender waist that seemed almost too thin to support his upper body. Sensing her gaze, he looked back with a grin before disappearing through the bathroom door, and the sound of a running shower filled the room. Rolling over on her stomach, Shelley thought about the disappearing sensations. His every touch and the time she spent with him seemed unreal, as if she had just woken up from a dream. And yet it was undoubtedly a reality, and therein lay the problem. Shelley Spaulding, a 36-year-old wife and mother, began to realize the seriousness of her actions. For the first time in 15 years of their marriage, she cheated on her husband, Jerry Spaulding. She betrayed him, her daughter Tracy, and the sanctity of their family, without a second thought, until now. As the realization of her actions penetrated her clouded mind, she began to tremble. Her body, which had been designed exclusively for her husband, now felt tense and awkward. She was seized with a desire to run away. Panic seized her, prompting her to act. She slid off the bed, frantically searched for underwear and a bra, hurriedly put them on, and then a skirt, blouse, and shoes. Grabbing her purse and jacket, she rushed to the door and opened it just as the sound of the shower stopped. She closed the door noiselessly behind her, walked quickly down the corridor and down the stairs to the lobby. After making sure that no one was watching her, she quickly left through the front door without looking around. Catching a taxi, she returned to her car and drove away without looking back. Jerry's lavish gift, a dark blue Cadillac Escalade, silently glided her towards their sizable abode on Scotland Drive, nestled in the affluent enclave of Scottsdale, Arizona. As she pulled into the driveway, she waited for the garage door to open before parking inside. Switching off the engine, she sat still, allowing her racing heart to calm and the sweat on her face to evaporate. The engine's cooling tick provided a background noise but did little to alleviate the wrenching pain in her stomach. She endured, waiting for the turmoil to pass and regain composure. Exiting the car, she entered the eerily quiet house, devoid of her daughter Tracy, who was at cheerleader practice, and Jerry not expected home until the day after tomorrow. She had been aware of their absence when she agreed to meet Reed Cunningham at the hotel earlier that day. With no one awaiting her return and no need for deception, she had made her choice freely to betray the trust of those closest to her. Shelley entered the expansive great room and sank into one of the plush leather chairs positioned in front of the fireplace, which dominated the entire southern wall. The wall, adorned with stone, soared two stories high, vanishing into the beamed and vaulted ceiling 20 feet above. Recently featured in House Beautiful, their home had garnered praise as one of the most exquisite in Scottsdale, with its architecture hailed as innovative and inspiring. However, none of this registered with Shelley as she gazed at the now dark 90-inch flat panel television centrally placed in the entertainment unit flanking the fireplace. Shelley worked as a receptionist for Walter Kincaid, a candidate running for the U.S. Senate from Arizona. For the past five months, she had been actively involved in his campaign, and two months ago, she had crossed paths with Reed Cunningham at one of the numerous fundraisers she organized. He was charming, exceptionally handsome, and he made no secret of his attraction to her. Initially finding it amusing, Shelley later found herself drawn to his advances, though she couldn't quite pinpoint why, and that uncertainty troubled her. His visits grew more frequent, his attention towards her more overt and insistent, and throughout it all, she reciprocated. At his slightest word, her stomach somersaulted, a casual touch sent tingles across the skin. His fingers brushed softly, a smile or a glance raised her temperature. This was a sensation entirely unfamiliar, surpassing even her feelings for her husband. 
She should have halted it immediately upon sensing the desire intensifying, yet she didn't. The fixation that was Reed Cunningham burgeoned within her, consuming her entirely. At home, her thoughts centered on him. In bed with her husband, it was Reed she envisioned. Most damning was the alteration in her feelings towards Jerry, her husband. She became curt with him, the notion of intimacy with him suddenly repugnant. The man she had loved and been devoted to for so long now seemed a stranger, unrecognizable. Instead of love, there was only emptiness, filled solely by thoughts of Reed. She felt restless, constantly yearning to engage in something she knew was wrong. All she could discern was the perilous proximity to acquiescing to his proposition to meet outside their usual encounters. That peril materialized today when she uttered, Yes. Today's events remained a mystery to her. She was answering the phone when he came in. When she saw him, she smiled, and he came up to her after a short conversation with some advertising agent. They took a break together and went out to get some fresh air. Reed gave his usual speech, then reached out to stroke her hair and touch her cheek. Suddenly something inside her changed and she realized that she couldn't refuse him. She followed him to his car and then back to the hotel. When he was in his room, thoughts of Jerry and Tracy disappeared as his hands worked their magic. Her desire grew by the second. For a few minutes, they were as close as distraught animals. They stood side by side, coming to their senses, and finally Reed pushed her back onto the bed. And it all happened again. Reed wasn't finished yet and they had several more encounters that afternoon before she got up, dressed, and drove home. It was almost 5.30 when the sound of a slamming door brought her back to the present, signaling Tracy's arrival. She sighed, got up from her chair, and went to resume her role as a mom. Although she felt a pang at this thought, she soon forgot it as Tracy began sharing details about her day and the new boy who had asked her out. Tracy was deep into her story as Shelley started taking things out of the freezer to prepare a late dinner. Shelley worked steadily, her mind elsewhere, while her daughter continued talking. Luckily, Tracy didn't notice that sometimes her mother wasn't really listening. The two of them sat at the table engaging in conversation as they enjoyed the simple dinner she had prepared. She found it incredibly pleasant to spend this time with Tracy talking about matters that concerned only them. As she watched her daughter, she felt her love for her deepen. She cherished her daughter and her life, the experiences they shared and her daughter's adventures. Her thoughts drifted to Jerry, who had worked tirelessly to provide for them, and she felt a pang of pain and instant regret for her actions earlier that afternoon. But then Reed Cunningham's face came to mind, and all guilt vanished. Her daughter's words faded as well. Tracy didn't notice her mother's sudden change and the silence that followed, not until she stopped talking and waited for her mother to comment on her story about Jason, her current crush. When she looked up, she saw her mother staring out the window, clearly lost in thought. Feeling hurt, Tracy stood up, took her plate to the sink, and left the kitchen. Her mother barely noticed which hurt Tracy more than she expected. But her mother had been like this for months now, and Tracy was becoming increasingly worried. She decided to wait until her dad came home and then talk to him. He would know what to do. After all, he was dad, and he could fix anything. Jerry Spaulding was one of those rare young men who in high school discovered a crucial secret. He attended numerous speeches in the high school gymnasium about getting an education, finding a good job, working hard, and advancing in life. While he listened to every word, he didn't believe any of it. He had no desire to impress those above him. He wanted to work, yes, but not for others. His mindset was completely different. Jerry knew exactly what he wanted, to become rich by working for the most important person in the world, himself. Instead of going to college and learning a trade or vocation after graduating high school, Jerry frequented the library and immersed himself in the self-help section. There, he learned about buying and selling real estate in a way that required little money, but had the potential for significant profit. He read, studied, and researched, 
until he decided to give it a try. He found an old two-unit apartment complex that someone wanted to sell at a bargain price due to its depreciation. Jerry decided to make his first deal. Living at home with his father, after his mother had died of cancer when he was 15, Jerry and his dad had managed to get by. Although he was 18 and could legally enter into a contract, Jerry had no credit history, so he needed his father to co-sign. His father, a very smart man, quickly understood his son's intentions and fully supported him, co-signing with minimal hesitation. He kept a close eye on Jerry, but soon saw that Jerry knew what he was doing. Within two months, Jerry sold the property at a nice profit, paid off the loan, and quickly found two more properties to flip. He sold those two, earning enough money to operate independently. Jerry was on his way to becoming rich and never looked back. At the age of 22, he was already a millionaire and on the path to even greater wealth. His company was securing increasingly larger deals, and his name was well known throughout Scottsdale. He was frequently invited to parties where the affluent mingled and networked. At one such event, hosted by a notable individual, he met Shelley Lambert. He fell hopelessly in love with her that very night and pursued her with the same intensity he applied to everything else in his life, wholeheartedly. His sole aim was to win her over. They dated for nearly a year before Jerry proposed. Shelley was ready and accepted his marriage proposal. Her parents, both school teachers, were impressed by Jerry's wealth and personality and gave their blessing. Jerry's father had already grown fond of Shelley expressing his delight at the prospect of having her as his new daughter. They planned their wedding and were married three months after Shelley turned 21. It was fortunate that Tracy's arrival was delayed, as Shelley and Jerry discovered her pregnancy before the wedding. Everyone else accepted the timing, or at least pretended to. Time passed for the three of them, and they eventually became one of the wealthiest families in Scottsdale. Jerry and Shelley bought their current home when Tracy was two years old and had lived there ever since. Over the years, they expanded the house several times, adding a pool, a large patio with a grill and all the trimmings, and a substantial koi pond with water plants. These enhancements transformed their home into a showpiece featured in House Beautiful. Although they did not take any measures to prevent Shelley from getting pregnant again, they were unsuccessful in having a second child. A clinic visit revealed that Shelley was unlikely to conceive naturally, making Tracy's birth almost miraculous. Jerry continued making deals and amassed even more wealth. Shelley stayed home to raise their daughter and became active in local charities and politics. As Tracy grew older and spent more time away from home, Shelley increased her involvement in these activities. Eventually, she decided to volunteer in the political arena, joining the campaign of Walter Kincaid, a candidate for the U.S. Senate, just three months ago. Jerry Spaulding was satisfied with how his day had turned out. He was in Denver and had spent most of the afternoon reviewing the contracts he had negotiated with the consortium that owned the piece of property he desired. They were sharp. He had to acknowledge that. They spotted a couple of things he had included deliberately, but they didn't realize those items were meant to be noticed. In fact, there were several distractions they missed entirely and he felt compelled to point them out as if they were a surprise to him, too. This helped establish the trust he needed to ensure the deal went according to his plan. The highlight of the day was when everyone signed the contract, and the secretary, who was also a notary public, notarized it. This made the contract legal and binding, giving him exactly what he wanted. The property itself wasn't worth the amount he paid, which made the consortium happy as they believed they had outsmarted the outsider. Jerry let them keep that impression as he took his copies and left. He knew something they didn't. That property was right in the path of an expansion planned by the world's largest car manufacturer in their city. He now owned the most crucial piece in their expansion plans and knew exactly how to leverage its true value. Returning to his room in a rented limousine, Jerry calculated that he could make a significant profit from the sale of this property. After covering the costs and preparing his investors, he will easily earn two million and possibly more. And all this could happen within a month. This would undoubtedly upset some locals, but it would make him very happy. Besides, Shelley would be very happy. 
He thought that such unexpected luck could lift her mood, which she had been in lately. He had no idea what caused her mood. He tried to talk about it several times, but she always waved him off, saying that it was just a figment of his imagination. They hadn't made love in almost six weeks. They had intimacy twice, but it wasn't love. She allowed it, trying to hide her disinterest. He was angry enough to finish the job, focusing only on his own satisfaction. She didn't complain and pretended that she cared if he was happy, but he knew that wasn't the case. The limo pulled up, let him out, and he told the driver that his services were no longer needed for this trip. He tipped the driver a hundred dollars and made sure he knew his name by giving him his card. He knew he would be back and liked to leave a good impression on people who might be valuable to him in the future. He entered the lobby of the only hotel in this small town and checked at the desk for any messages. There were none, which saddened him. But then again, he hadn't really expected her to return his calls. She hadn't bothered to lately. Once in his room, Jerry began making his obligatory calls. He contacted his partners to inform them that the deal was finalized and accepted their congratulations. They were the investors, and at one time he had needed them more than they needed him. Now things were different. To keep doing business with him and make a lot of money, they had to buy shares in his corporation, the one he founded himself, specializing in real estate, but not the kind involving homes or even businesses. Jerry bought and sold parcels of land with the potential for huge profits. He was skilled at it and had an uncanny ability to predict which parcels would be profitable and which would not. He had made a small fortune in just a few years and had turned that into even bigger gains. His associates were no longer actively engaged in his endeavors, but he continued to keep them informed and offered them opportunities in significant deals, Maintaining amicable relations with them and spreading the risk in major projects seemed like good business to him. It had proven beneficial for all parties involved as they remained willing to invest heavily when he assured them it was in their best interest. Over the years, Jerry had amassed considerable wealth, which he used to purchase the house and spacious yard that Shelley adored. He indulged her every desire, whether it was a new car, jewelry, or fine clothing. Providing her with these luxuries brought him immense joy, fueled by his deep affection for her. Despite his unwavering love, he couldn't help but feel disappointed when Shelley showed reluctance towards having a second child, despite their shared pride and joy in Tracy. Nevertheless, he acquiesced to her wishes, as he always did. After attending to his business partners, he phoned his house. Waiting as the phone rang, he felt a slight disappointment when Tracy answered instead of Shelley. Hi, Tracy. It's Dad. What's going on? I was expecting to hear from your mom, but no calls. Is everything all right? Nothing's wrong, Dad. It's just Mom acting the same way she has been for the past few months. We were talking at dinner tonight, and she just withdrew. I don't know what's up, but it's really bothering me. I just want you to come home and make things like they used to be before everything went downhill. Where is she now? Can she come to the phone? She's in her room. She went up there after dinner and hasn't come back down. She's acting strange, Dad. Just come home, please. I'm leaving tomorrow morning and I'll be back early in the afternoon. Don't tell her I'm coming home a day early. I'll surprise her with something nice. It'll be from both of us. How's that sound? Sounds like it might work. Okay, I won't say anything. By the way, I'll be home late tomorrow. We have a meet, and it won't be over until about seven. I'll see you sometime after that. Love you, Dad. Jerry hung up, pondered his daughter's words, and was surprised she had noticed the changes, too. He packed his bags, ready to catch his flight the next morning. He wanted to get home as soon as possible. Maybe he could start to make things right and figure out what was wrong. At home. Arriving at his office in downtown Scottsdale after a brief flight, it was still early morning. After checking in with his secretary and reviewing his notes, he came across one that piqued his interest. It was a message from Nikki Prescott, a close friend whose late husband had been a significant influence on his career. Despite the passing of her husband three years prior, he had maintained his friendship with Nikki. After tidying his desk, he dialed her number. 
During their conversation, they caught up on recent events before he inquired about how he could assist her. Her response caught him off guard, unsettling him. Jerry, I care deeply about you and I really like Shelley, but I need to express my concerns. I've noticed something between Shelley and this man, Reed Cunningham. He's a major contributor to Walt's campaign and has a rather dubious background. I've seen them together at campaign headquarters and it's worrisome. Jerry listened intently, feeling a sinking sensation in his stomach as the words washed over him. He was aware that she supported Walter Kincaid, the same man his wife worked for. The timing of these revelations, coinciding with his and his daughter's suspicions about Shelley, seemed too significant to ignore. What did you observe, Nikki? Did anything seem out of the ordinary? Jerry asked, hoping for a reassuring answer. Well, yesterday they left together without saying a word to anyone. His car was gone, but hers remained in the parking lot for over an hour. And today, neither of them showed up. Shelley never misses a Thursday, especially when Walt goes over the agenda for the next week, Nikki explained. It does sound concerning, doesn't it? I suppose I'll need to investigate further. I'm sorry to have to bring this to your attention, Jerry, but I care about you deeply. You and Tracy don't deserve this. You've always been there for me, and I want to do the same for you. Let's hope it's nothing serious. After a few more minutes of conversation, Jerry hung up the phone, fighting the urge to react impulsively. Confronting his wife immediately wasn't the wisest choice. He needed to gather evidence first. He knew she'd likely lie to cover her tracks. Proof, if available, would be crucial. The affair commences. While Jerry was en route home the next morning, his plane traversing the skies above the Rocky Mountains, Shelley was beginning her day. Shelley woke up at her usual time and ensured Tracy was awake and preparing for school. She had gone to bed early the previous night, her mind tangled in thoughts oscillating between her husband and Reed Cunningham. Despite her strong guilt over what she had done, she couldn't shake the images of Reed from her mind. His eyes, his smile, his muscular physique, and particularly his sizable endowment overshadowed her guilt, pushing thoughts of Jerry into the background. But then reminders of her husband would flood back, reigniting her guilt. Jerry was the man she loved unequivocally. He was her rock, her love, and her future. He was her husband and Tracy's father, and nothing was going to alter that. Despite her concerns about jeopardizing their marriage, she couldn't understand why she couldn't stop thinking about Reed. What was it that kept pulling her back to him? That morning, Tracy was quiet as she prepared breakfast, popping two slices of bread in the toaster, pouring herself a glass of chocolate milk, spreading butter on the toast, and generously sprinkling it with cinnamon and sugar. She sat at the table sullenly, not engaging with her mother. Shelley attempted to initiate conversation several times, but eventually gave up, not overly concerned by her daughter's silence. Watching Tracy leave for the bus, Shelley felt a slight sense of relief, needing some time alone to gather her thoughts. Jerry would be returning home tomorrow, and she felt the pressure to become the wife he expected, acknowledging that she hadn't fulfilled that role for some time. As Jerry's plane landed at the airport, Shelley dressed for the day ahead. An hour later, she stood at the sink ready to leave for the weekly agenda meeting at Walter Kincaid's headquarters, a commitment she never missed. Just as she was finishing up breakfast dishes, the doorbell rang. Wiping her hands on a dish towel, she answered the door to find Reed standing there, grinning. Surprised by his sudden appearance, she stepped back, allowing him to enter and close the door behind her. Noticing her wide-open eyes and amazed expression, he silently walked up to her and took her in his arms. You look and smell amazing. I couldn't stop thinking about you all night, and I couldn't wait any longer this morning. I need to be with you again. But this time I want to enjoy every moment right here in your husband's bed. Shelley struggled with conflicting feelings. Jerry was coming home tomorrow, and she needed to save their marriage to make sense of it. Still, she could feel Reed's presence igniting desire in her. His charm was irresistible and she found herself quickly falling under his spell. It was her only chance to refuse him. 
Please, stop it. Please. Her struggle lacked conviction. Her movements were more an instinctive reaction to the touch of his body against hers than a sincere plea for freedom. Reed completely ignored her pleas. Instead, he reached down to stroke her. A grin almost appeared on his face. Knowing that she was giving in to him, he continued. Grabbing her by the knees with one hand and wrapping the other around her back, he lifted her effortlessly, continuing to kiss her as he carried her upstairs to the master bedroom. He laid her on the rumpled bed where she had slept alone last night. Meanwhile, while Jerry was talking to Nikki Prentice, Shelley and Reed once again betrayed Jerry's trust. While Reed was satisfying Shelley, Jerry was making plans to expose his wife. For the next hour, Shelley and Reed were close. They were completely absorbed in each other, forgetting about everyone else as they were exhausted from fatigue. Having satisfied their desires, they took a shower together before Reed had to go to a meeting. Reed left quickly, unable to stand the awkward silence and attempts at casual conversation any longer. When Reed's explorer left the area where Jerry and Shelley lived, Jerry was finally thinking about his plans, knowing exactly what he intended to do. On the way home, Jerry began to implement his plans. He decided not to warn Shelley until he had a good reason to do so. Mindful of his obligations to his daughter, he bought flowers and Chinese takeout for dinner, hoping it would calm her down. It was a gesture of love, albeit ostentatious. Meanwhile, Shelley was at home and relaxing on the back porch with a drink and a magazine. Jerry watched her from the window, still fascinated by her beauty, perhaps even more so than when they first got married. Her long, straight blonde hair with short bangs framing her face and piercing light blue eyes remained irresistible to him. Despite the fact that she had gained a little weight, it only accentuated her curves, which he found very attractive. He pondered the course of their lives thus far, puzzled by the sudden and drastic changes that had taken place within such a short span of time. Until about three months ago, their lives had been ordinary, characterized by occasional predictability, yet infused with moments of spontaneity and perpetual enjoyment. Tracy was the light of their lives, and they both actively participated in her activities whenever possible. Despite Jerry's demanding work schedule, he always made sure to be present for them on weekends and most evenings, often taking Shelley along when he traveled. But then everything began to shift. Shelley grew increasingly quiet, edgy, overly sensitive about trivial matters and their intimate life ground to a halt. Apart from a couple of fleeting instances, she remained distant and detached. Jerry couldn't fathom what triggered this change, and attempts to broach the subject with her were met with resistance. Now, however, things were starting to make sense thanks to Nikki's phone call which shed light on the situation. Returning to the kitchen, Jerry grabbed a cold bottle of beer, arranged the flowers in a vase, and left the food in the oven on a low heat to keep warm until Tracy returned home. Glancing once more at Shelley, who sat alone on the porch, he felt compelled to let her know he was back. He stepped outside, letting the door close with a resounding thud. Shelley turned to look at him, her expression one of surprise, tinged perhaps with a hint of disappointment, though Jerry couldn't be sure. Hey, sweetheart, what brings you back home early? I was expecting you tomorrow. Apologies for surprising you, but I wrapped up my work and decided to head home instead of spending another lonely night in a hotel. No worries, dear. I was just caught off guard. I'm happy you're back. Are you hungry? Not yet. I grabbed some Chinese food on the way and popped it in the oven. I can hold off until dinner. That's thoughtful of you. Tracy will be thrilled to see you. She seemed a bit down last night. I don't know why, but I noticed it. Maybe you could talk to her, cheer her up. Perhaps. We'll see. As he spoke, he observed Shelley's attention return to her magazine, confirming his suspicions. She was thinking of someone else now, not him. The affection he used to see in her eyes upon his return was absent, replaced by disinterest. The realization hit him hard almost like a physical blow to his heart. He turned away, heading back inside before Shelley could notice the tears welling up in his eyes. Rushing through the kitchen, he sought refuge in his office, shutting the door, locking it, and sinking heavily into his chair. 
It was then that he let himself go, tears flowing freely. Meanwhile, Shelley grappled with similar thoughts as Jerry stood there. She tried to summon the expected feelings of relief and joy at his return. But all she could think of was her and Reed that morning in bed, lost in passion. Shame flushed her face as she quickly averted her gaze to the magazine in her hands, hiding her thoughts from Jerry. She was tormented by her obsession with Reed, unable to shake the memories of their time together. Her mind was consumed with thoughts of their next encounter, a certainty she couldn't escape. They navigated through the evening and into the next day without acknowledging any underlying issues. Jerry remained reserved, while Shelley appeared distant and disinterested in both her husband and daughter. Their bedtime routine followed its usual course, with Shelley retiring first, already asleep by the time Jerry joined her. The following morning, Jerry and Tracy departed, spending most of the day away. Shelley, preoccupied with work, didn't notice their absence. Later, when Reed approached her, she accompanied him to a motel, where they spent the day together until evening approached. After showering and dressing, she returned home to find them gone. She prepared a modest dinner from leftovers and awaited their return, her thoughts consumed by Reed, as they had been for months. When Jerry and Tracy returned later, they recounted their day, claiming to have attended a baseball game where Tracy's boyfriend played, followed by milkshakes and a movie. Jerry sat beside his daughter, amused when her boyfriend attempted to put his arm around her, only to find Jerry's arm already there. Tracy took it all in stride, enjoying the company of both her father and boyfriend. Shelley felt a pang of guilt realizing she didn't know who Tracy's boyfriend was. The routine continued unchanged for the following two weeks. Shelley met with Reed twice more under the guise of volunteering. Then, on a Tuesday, Shelley announced her intention to work at the campaign headquarters for a couple of hours. She was vague about her return time when informing Jerry. He calmly agreed to start dinner and look after Tracy. After their call ended, Jerry made a discreet phone call, issuing instructions to the person on the other end, arranging for a callback the following morning. Jerry and Tracy enjoyed a dinner together consisting of pizza, Pepsi, and hot cinnamon buns for dessert. They seemed content in each other's company, with no apparent longing for Shelley's presence. Tracy did mention that her mother had been absent from many dinners lately, and when she was home, wasn't very enjoyable to be around. Jerry listened to Tracy's words without expressing any negative sentiment towards Shelley. However, he couldn't help but acknowledge in his thoughts that Shelley had allowed not only her marriage, but also her role as a mother to slip in terms of priority. While Tracy was likely in her room chatting on the phone with her boyfriend Josh, Jerry sat half asleep in his chair until Shelley returned home. He noticed it was past seven, much later than usual due to the demands of the campaign. Jerry remained silent as Shelley announced her arrival, and wasn't even surprised when she quickly headed to the shower. As he bowed his head, a few tears escaped him. The pain surged back, as intense as ever, not for the first time. Until recently, he held on to a faint hope that he might be mistaken, that Nikki was wrong. He wished, for both his and Tracy's sake, that their relationship hiccup was just that, and that Shelley still held their marriage sacred. But now he was certain it was all a facade. The evidence was irrefutable. She lived a lie and her promises were empty. Jerry battled the anger, suppressing it with the self-control he prided himself on. He had built a fortune for them, created a home, and given everything he could. He had remained faithful and true to his promises to both of them. His commitment to Shelley remained unbroken, a source of fierce pride. Despite temptations and promises from others, he rejected them, finding all he desired and needed at home. His wife and daughter were his entire world. Tracy would receive the best possible start in life. Her education expenses were covered, allowing her to focus her time where it was most needed. He promised to ensure her wedding would be a joyful occasion when the time came, and he would ensure that both she and her chosen partner had a solid foundation for their life together. These were commitments he intended to uphold, regardless of his own circumstances. 
He took pride in his ability to keep his promises to Tracy. That night, Jerry slept in his office, waking early to finalize the paperwork for the Denver deal. Once completed, he ensured the documents were properly filed. Next month, he would transfer the property and earn his $2 million. Knowing the buyers were Asian, he arranged for his share to be deposited directly into a Swiss bank account, which had been well-funded over the years from dealings with international clients. This money remained undisclosed to both Shelley and the U.S. government, as it never entered or left the country. The remaining balance would be noted and deposited into the corporation's accounts without any government scrutiny. Once he completed the paperwork, the anticipated call finally came through. As he listened, the bitterness swelling inside him caused a lump in his throat, nearly choking him. He took notes, grunting when needed, and concluded the call with instructions to send over the final report along with pictures. With the evidence in hand and the necessary information obtained, he now knew the who, where, and when. This wasn't an isolated incident. According to his source, it had occurred at least five times. It was sufficient. No further action would be required. Once was all it took to shatter the promise indefinitely. Reed Cunningham, the owner of his own establishment Cunningham Cabinets and Counters, ran a small but exclusive company specializing in the production of custom-made furniture for kitchens and bathrooms. The company managed every aspect, from design to installation, focusing exclusively on those with significant funds. Starting a project worth less than $100,000 was out of the question. Cunningham services, which served mainly wealthy people, were in great demand among those who sought to make an impression. It was rumored that his skill went beyond cabinet making, meeting the needs of clients seeking excellence in various fields. Wealthy patrons showered praise on his skill. Jerry, among other things, took note of this. Wanting to hurt Reed Cunningham, he had no desire to harm innocent people. Recognizing the innocence of Cunningham's employees, Jerry abandoned the idea of liquidating the company, focusing instead on Reed's personal persecution. While his family would inevitably suffer, Jerry reasoned that the burden was on Reed, not him. Reed's family ties, especially his marriage and young daughters, became his only vulnerable point. The reports pointed to Reed's unwavering devotion to his family, and Jerry angrily considered this detail suitable for use. Jerry carefully reproduced the incriminating evidence, including photographs of Reed and Shelley in compromising poses. Studying one of the images, Jerry recoiled in disgust, but at the same time felt satisfied, knowing how much pain this would cause Reed's wife. Judging that Reed and Shelley had brought this on themselves, Jerry washed his hands of it and no longer worried about their well-being. Over the following two days, Jerry busied himself with various tasks. Firstly, he closed all his active credit cards and joint accounts, withdrawing exactly half from each. Then he ensured most of his assets were in corporate accounts not subject to community property laws. Next, he retrieved all of Tracy's jewelry from the safe deposit boxes, had it appraised by a trusted jeweler, and obtained a certified note of its value. After selling the jewelry, he deposited half of the cash into Tracy's account. Despite knowing he would have to pay alimony, Jerry accepted it as part of the divorce settlement. He finalized the divorce decree at his lawyer's office, scheduling for Tracy to be served at his home the next day at 12.15. In addition, he arranged for a copy of all his information, including pictures, to be delivered to Reed Cunningham's wife at precisely 11 o'clock the following morning. That night, Jerry spent with his wife and daughter, neither suspecting what was to come. He wished to spare Tracy the pain of divorce, but knew it was inevitable. His only solace was in planning to speak to her truthfully as soon as possible. Interestingly, Shelley attempted to be amicable that evening, trying to engage Tracy in conversation. However, Tracy seemed unwilling to open up. Jerry found amusement in watching Shelley's frustration, especially when she began asking him about his work something she had never shown interest in during their marriage. Despite his attempts to maintain seriousness, Jerry couldn't help but laugh, prompting Shelley's anger. Eventually, he excused himself to the patio, 
still chuckling. He stayed outside until he regained composure, then entered the house to find Tracy absent in her room. Settling down, he prepared to spend another night downstairs until Shelley interjected, seemingly irate. He suspected she was gearing up to demonstrate something to him. Let her try. Unbeknownst to her, he had no interest in her plans anymore. I want to go to campaign headquarters tomorrow. They need me to handle phones and messages. Do you mind? I know it's Saturday and I dislike working weekends, but they really need me, she said. Jerry nearly chuckled. He knew who truly needed her. Wanting this to end, he deliberated before replying. You need to be home at noon tomorrow. There are papers you must sign and they can't wait. I have to insist. Noon to half past is all you'll require. After that, you're free to do as you wish. Though Shelley seemed inclined to argue, she opted against it, deeming it uncharacteristic. Reluctantly, she agreed and retired to bed, planning to call Reed and arrange a meeting later in the afternoon. Closing the bedroom door, she prepared for bed. As she lay down, her hand instinctively reached to the left, where Jerry usually slept. Glancing at the empty space, a chill ran down her spine. It dawned on her that Jerry hadn't slept beside her for the past few days or even longer. Tears welled up as the weight of sadness engulfed her. Why was she acting like that? What was going on in her head? Reed seemed to have some kind of power over her, dominating her thoughts. Her marriage was falling apart, and she blamed herself completely. Her bond with her daughter was waning, and Jerry ridiculed her feeble attempts to contact him. She realized how stupid they were and wondered what else he had seen. In an instant, she was seized with the fear of losing everything she held dear, her loved ones. Deep down, she admitted that she loved Tracy and Jerry more than anything in the world. What was she doing? Suddenly, her infatuation with Reed Cunningham seemed like a pointless pursuit. The mere thought of him no longer caused pleasure. Instead, it caused a feeling of disgust and fear. She rolled over onto her stomach and buried her face in the pillow, suppressed by the sobs that shook her body. How did she get to this point in her life? How did she push Jerry away so easily? How did she get into bed with another man who didn't love her? She knew Reed didn't love her. Remembering the recent moments of intimacy with Jerry, she realized that she couldn't remember the last time they had really made love. It wasn't like that. She lay there and realized that Jerry had treated her the same way Reed had, rudely, without any tenderness. Disgusted, she rushed to the bathroom. But before she reached it, she threw up and collapsed on the cold, tiled floor. Collapsed onto the bed, feeling nauseous and drenched in sweat, she resolved that the next day she would finally break things off with Reed. It had to come to an end. She needed to focus on her family and Jerry once again. She truly loved him. The mere thought of life without him terrified her. Tomorrow would mark a turning point and she was determined to make amends. She would go to any lengths for him. Meanwhile, downstairs, Jerry lay curled up on the couch in his study, his eyes closed. He had shed all the tears he could, weathering the torrent of pain, anger, and every other emotion that signaled the demise of 15 years of his life. Tomorrow heralded the beginning of a new chapter, one he intended to kick off with a bang for the two people who mattered most. The last day shortly before noon, Jerry returned to the house from the garden where he had been working all morning. After washing his face and hands, he changed his dirty work clothes for a looser shirt and trousers. After giving Tracy $50 and sending her and her friends to the mall, he headed to his office, closing the door behind him. From a small safe, he took out a report and several photographs. Looking at the enlarged photo of Shelley again, he felt only a slight stab of anger. He put the photo face down on the report. He was ready. At noon precisely, Jerry opened the door of his office and called Shelley inside. She quickly entered with a smile and took her usual place opposite his desk where she usually signed documents. Closing the door behind her, Jerry walked around the table and sat down, holding the photo face down. He waited for Shelley to calm down before speaking. Okay, I'm ready. What do you need me to sign? Not yet. 
First, I would like to show you something and listen to your thoughts. The documents requiring your signature will arrive at 12.15, so we have a little time. At that moment, the phone rang and Jerry answered. After a brief pause, he hung up. It rang again, and once more Jerry answered. After listening, he smiled and turned to Shelley. Would you like to speak with a Reed Cunningham? He seems quite distressed and is asking for you. Shelley paled and shook her head vigorously. She appeared extremely nervous as she responded. No, I don't want to speak to him. Tell him no. Just end the call. I apologize, Mr. Cunningham. She doesn't wish to speak with you presently. Perhaps another time. Goodbye. The phone rang again, but this time Jerry let it continue. He observed Shelley, pleased to see her panic growing. Eventually, he decided to relieve her, so he unplugged the phone to silence it. Shelley's expression turned serious. She turned to Jerry, questioning. Why the delay? I wanted to go volunteer today. Why can't we go now? Shelley wondered why he had called her at home. It seemed unreasonable. She needed to get things done and figure out what was happening. Little did she know Jerry was about to provide an answer. Jerry pulled a picture towards him, examining it with the blank side facing Shelley. He then turned it, revealing it to her. She looked down, her forced smile disappearing instantly. You knew. How did you know? Oh, God, not now. Please, God, not now. Please. Shelley's complexion grew even paler. Her hand instinctively rose to cover her mouth while the other gripped the armrest of her chair tightly. She swayed back and forth and Jerry feared she might faint. His apprehensions proved valid as he witnessed her slump sideways, her eyes rolling up until only the whites were visible. Acting on instinct, Jerry rushed to prevent her fall but was unable to do so. Nevertheless, he lifted her up and repositioned the chair. Exiting to the hallway, Jerry fetched a glass of water from the half-bath, returning to find Shelley still unconscious. This troubled Jerry, albeit his primary concern now was her consciousness for the delivery of the divorce papers. His empathy had dissipated. Among the papers was a restraining order, compelling her to vacate the premises, and Jerry was keen on ensuring she comprehended its contents. Although crafting that particular document had required time and attention, its impact had been persuasive, convincing the judge. After deliberation, Jerry, with a nonchalant shrug, approached Shelley and abruptly poured the glass of water over her. Startled, she sputtered and regained consciousness, shaking her head and wiping her face. Her gaze fell on the picture, prompting a fresh wave of tears. Jerry, please, allow me to express my deep remorse. Please, Jerry, let me communicate with you. Allow me to attempt to elucidate. I must have been out of my mind. Jerry, please permit me to clarify. Jerry, satisfied with her return, resumed his seat behind the desk. He produced several more pictures, all of standard size, and tossed them toward her as she begged. She barely glanced at them before pushing them aside. Put them away. They're meaningless. Reed means nothing. It's over, Jerry. Finished. I'll never see him again. Never. Jerry interrupted her then, lacking patience for her deceitful words and hollow promises. Her actions conveyed everything he needed to know. There are a few things I need to inform you of, Shelley. I've written them down so you don't have to remember, but here they are. First, I've closed all our joint accounts. They're now solely in your name, and only half of our previous funds are left in there. Second, I've had the jewelry appraised. Most of it I bought for you as tokens of my love for you and our daughter. But my love for you has died, and since I purchased it for you, I've chosen to sell it. I've left half of its value in your accounts. The sentiment in the jewelry has died, and the pieces themselves hold no significance anymore. Firstly, I've ensured that all the corporation's funds are securely placed in corporate accounts beyond your reach. Lastly, documents will arrive at 1215 for your signature. I'm proceeding with the divorce, Shelley, without a doubt. Your protests are futile. 
I'm done with you, regardless of your words or actions. You've betrayed me, committed adultery, and I want you gone. Oh, Jerry, please don't say that. I'm deeply sorry. I made a mistake, and I regret it sincerely. I was going to end it today. I know I was wrong. Last night, I realized the damage to our family and how terribly wrong I've been. It's over, Jerry, and I want to reconcile. Please forgive me. Don't do this, Jerry. I understand my fault. Just then, the doorbell rang. Jerry rose, circled the desk, and took Shelley's arm, pulling her from the chair. She resisted as he led her to the door. Holding her, he opened the door for the courier. The young man addressed Shelley directly. Are you Mrs. Shelley Spaulding? Shelley nodded, avoiding his gaze. He gently took her hand and placed an envelope in it. You've been served. With that, he turned and walked away down the sidewalk. Jerry ushered Shelley back into the office and guided her to her seat once more. She was too overwhelmed to do anything except follow Jerry's instructions. Taking his own seat behind the desk, Jerry addressed her again. There are a few more things I need to tell you. I made a duplicate of the report and the photos of you two and had them sent to Tina Cunningham today. She now knows what you know about her husband. Those calls you received were from your lover, Reed Cunningham. He likely wanted to talk to you, perhaps to understand why I took the actions I did. Jerry chuckled audibly. People like him never seem to grasp how those they betray might strike back. Shelley's expression turned to one of disbelief. You didn't! How could you do that to him? How could you be so cruel? He has young daughters waiting for him at home. Jerry was enraged by her words. Cruel. Him? Insanity. Me? Cruel? What's gotten into you, Shelley? You and him are both married. Yet that didn't stop you from betraying your spouses and tearing apart your families. And now you want to point fingers at me while letting him off the hook? What did I ever do to deserve this? Did you just want to destroy me? Was that the plan all along, to ruin my marriage and my daughter's life? Is this your twisted idea of justice? Jerry, no. That was never my intention. We never wanted you or his wife to find out. Never. You were never supposed to know about my affair. Never. And I never wanted to hurt you. If you hadn't found out, you wouldn't have been hurt. Never. Never. Nev. Jerry cut through her denials. I regret to inform you that your partner is now facing significant trouble, much like yourself. Shelley, I hope whatever led to this outcome was worthwhile for you. I did my utmost to provide for you, pouring my whole heart into our relationship, never wavering until you chose to end it. Despite waiting patiently for months in the hope of your return, you only distanced yourself further, opting for him over us. You've achieved your desired outcome, but at the cost of abandoning us. No, that's not what I intended. I didn't anticipate this. Jerry, please don't cast me aside. Please, Jerry, I beg you. A restraining order has been issued, Shelley, barring you from residing in this house. You have 12 hours to gather your belongings and vacate. And rest assured, I fully intend to inform Tracy of your actions, and I cannot predict her response. She's old enough to make her own decisions about who she wants to live with. That choice will be hers. But I will disclose everything to her. That much I promise. Shelley appeared to have retreated into herself. Seated in the chair, she emanated a sense of defeat and exhaustion. Jerry, looking down at her, realized he lacked compassion. He felt a void within himself as he observed her a sensation that unsettled him. He reassured himself that he would be fine once she was out of the picture, though he hoped it was true. Shelley, I'm leaving for some time and I expect you to be gone before I return. Tracy is taken care of, so don't concern yourself if you even care at all. Your recent behavior made it evident that you've forgotten about her, just as you've forgotten about me and your promises to me. My lawyer's contact information is in the packet you received. Find yourself a good one and let them handle it. 
You should be financially secure since we're in a community property state, but don't expect a windfall. There will be alimony, and I won't contest it, but once I learned about your betrayal, I made my own plans. Since you were deceiving me, I ensured I came out on top. That's the only deception I've experienced in recent months. Congratulations. You've received what you deserved. There's nothing left for us to say except goodbye. With that, Jerry stood, removed his wedding ring, and dropped it in front of her. He had upheld his end of their agreement, and he took pride in that. He had never betrayed her and had done everything possible to care for her, to love her, and to create a safe and comfortable home. And she had defiled it. Jerry left the house, stepping into a future where Shelley no longer had a place. The consequences are harsh indeed.